in thinking about Memorial Day, it's the time that we set aside to remember those who gave the ultimate sacrifice in combat uh, for our country. It's a good holiday. I, I, I agree with it. But here's something I agree with more. No more war. We're done. We shouldn't have any more war. We're tired of death. We're tired of conflict. We're tired of people coming back in boxes. Every hero wasn't necessarily one who even wanted to be a hero, or planned to be a hero. Let's remember that for the most part, uh, the people who went out and fought in wars were just somebody's kid, sometimes as, old, as young as 16, 17, 18 years old. They may have been inflamed with ideals, they may have had patriotic fervor, but they didn't want to die and their parents surely didn't want them to die. There's a scene from the movie Saving Private Ryan where a lady is seen in a kitchen wearing an apron, a gray-headed lady, and uh, she notices a, a car pulls out in front and so she walks out of the front door onto the porch, and as she does so, uh, two men in uniform get out of the car with sad expressions on their face. And she collapses on the porch because she knows it's bad news. And it was that her, uh, two of her sons had died in combat. And this scene could be repeated by literally the thousands uh, in our country. I want us to turn to Micah chapter 4, because we have hope. We have something from God. We have something that He has said that He's going to do. And I can't wait. I can't wait till He does this. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the people, and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all the people will walk everyone in the name of his God. And we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Dear Father, help us to believe and look forward to and appreciate the reality and the truth that you have given us here, that one day there will be no more war. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Every Memorial Day we're reminded of those who died in war and we honor their sacrifices and acknowledge their contributions toward freedom and liberty. And yet with all the wars that have been fought and all the blood that has been shed, we still have those who envy, we still have those who are greedy, we have those who fear and those who hate, and it causes them to attack others and violence comes once more. According to Wikipedia, which uh, is often flawed but sometimes has some, some usable information, there has been about 10,624 battles in the history of mankind, and I'm certain that that number is low. Uh, this refers to actual battles of one nation against another that lasted for several days. And this doesn't even count border conflicts and skirmishes and raids and things of this nature. What can be said, certainly, is that from the beginning of human history after the fall, uh, from Cain and Abel up until now, there have been conflict. There has been war. Why is mankind so violent? 
What is behind the long history of conflict and strife? It is basically a manifestation of man's rebellion against God and his sovereignty. When it all comes down to it, when it all boils down, warfare is evidence of bad theology. It is evidence of godlessness. It is evidence of rebellion against God and his truth. If men loved God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength, and if men loved their brother as they loved themselves, there would be no war. If we practice the basics of Christianity, one person would not cross a border to take another person's property. One person would not mount up an army to go kill other people so that they can determine their lives uh, rather than have them self-determine. Conflict, strife, and war is basically a religious matter. And even though it is couched in secularism, secularism is, a, re is a, a religious matter because it is basically saying we do not recognize God, we do not recognize His Word, we do not recognize His will. And so it is important that we understand what has to take place for all wars to cease. The problem is today that men have varying beliefs and varying ideals. We see this in our text. It said every man will, will uh, serve his God, a little G-O-D, will walk in the name of his God. Now what it's referring to is the nations of the world have different gods, different false gods, and they go by that. But we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So there has to be something settled at a point. Who is God? Who is God? And until that is settled... Someone is going to fight about it, and there are men who even want to say that I am God. And really, when you think about it, when you put God off his throne, somebody else tries to get on that same throne. And so, what will it take? Well, all the, the things, all the wars that have ever been fought have been fought to determine this one question, who will rule? Who will rule? If you even go back to Cain and Abel, there's an element of that. And God spoke to Cain, and he said, if you bring the right kind of sacrifice, if you worship in the proper way, then you will have rule. And so rule has been a thing in the world ever since then. Uh, when we fought the American Revolution, it was determined who will rule. Will we rule ourselves, or will England rule us? And then we had to do it all over again in 1812. And every war since that time has been to determine who will rule over this area, who will rule over that area. Uh, all the wars of mankind have been fought to settle the question, who will rule? What will it take? What will it take to end all wars? Well, I just want to bring a few logical points that one will lead to the other. And I think, of course, if we're going to have the end of all wars, there has to be unity. These differences that people have, sometimes very strong differences, are what leads to warfare. So we need to have unity. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29, we find this. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright. God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Now, what this means is originally God made man in his image, and he was innocent, and he was perfect. But when the fall came and rebellion came into the heart of man, he began to make up different things. Now, I don't often read uh, uh, different uh, takes on the, on the Scripture, but I've got uh, three I want to read uh, that have this verse put in different English language. I have discovered only this. God made human beings for righteousness, but they seek out many alternatives. Another one put it this way, Truly this only I have found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Another one, I did learn one thing, we were completely honest when God created us, but now we have twisted minds. Now all of those are nuances of what this is said. Many inventions, an invention is something you make up. There was something real, and now there's something phony. You made up what was phony. And so, to end all wars, we must have unity. Uh, David said in Psalm 133, verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He didn't see a lot of that in his life because he was a warrior and had to go through many conflicts and wars. 
Uh, God raised him for that purpose. But his warrior heart was happiest when his brethren and all those that he knew were dwelling together in unity. He'd rather go to church. He'd rather have a a potluck dinner. He'd rather have a, a feast and enjoy fellowship and worship to God than to go to war. He did it because he had to. He did it because he was called to. But what was pleasant was unity. We will have to be in unity if we're going to have an end to wars. Now the question comes that unity is difficult to achieve and difficult to maintain. And in order to have unity, the second point I want to make is we will have to agree. Because you see, that's the rub, isn't it? Uh, When two people disagree, it's going to be very difficult for them to have unity, especially if it's about something that they hold to be important. So on what basis can we have unity? We have to agree. And men do not naturally agree. If history has proven one thing, it has proven this. Men frequently disagree, and often disagree turns violent. Uh, And to the tendency, to the tendency they have to invent an ideal, or to fabricate a god, or to justify uh, their actions, uh, they will do so. Uh, I realize that Uh, There have been uh, whole civilizations who created a pantheon of gods that they made to be images of themselves. In, In other words, instead of man being made in the image of God, they make the gods in the image of men. And they ascribe to those gods the same feelings and the same vices and the same crimes that they themselves are guilty of. Uh, I think of uh, those that would pray to their God to help them go and defeat the tribe over the ridge and to kill them and to take their belongings and come back and they would pray to their God to give them victory as they go and kill and plunder. And when they came back after having killed and they come back with the plunder, they'll all offer sacrifices to that God and thank Him for their help. In other words, they created a God that agrees with them about killing their neighbors and taking their things. That is what men are capable of doing. Now, how do you agree with someone who who believes that? I often think of the Vikings and the longboats and the the culture that they had, uh, the audacity of crossing over the waters and landing on a shore and believing that now that we're here, we can go kill people and take their stuff. And I think if they were to sit down for a moment and and say, uh, you know, uh, we're here to kill you and take your stuff. Will you agree with us about that? Do you think that those uh, unarmed monks and those simple peasant farmers would say, well, you know, that seems like a good idea. I've been thinking a lot about getting killed and losing all my stuff, and maybe I could agree with you. Of course not. You've automatically got a disagreement when people want to do you harm. Uh, Now, that is, of course, a, a flagrant example But there are other examples, not quite as flagrant, not quite as uh, on the surface, that people disagree about, that they tend to want to settle with war. Sometimes kings would go to war with another king just to see whose army was the best, just to see who was the the most wise uh, king. And many uh, people died to satisfy their ego. So there are going to be those who are going to fabricate an ideal, an idea, or even a god to justify their avarice, their greed, or their bloodlust. And this is what agreement, uh, why agreement is difficult. Now, here's some areas of difference that we see in the world uh, where agreement does not come. First of all, there's the, the, the idea of, is there a God? People disagree about that. Uh, some say, no, there's no God. Others say, yes, there is. And then they may argue after that about who he is or whatever he has done. But let's just stay with this one for now. Is there a God? There can be no greater place of disagreement in all of mankind than the disagreement between those who believe that no God exists and those who believe God does exist. That's a big one. Now, those who claim that they do not believe in God at all have made themselves the determinant of truth, have made themselves the authority in life, and what they say is right is right, what they say is wrong is wrong, because there is no God. Now those who say there is a God are divided up into many camps. There may be those who say there is a God, and He agrees with me about everything, which means I can kill you and take your stuff. 
And there are those who believe in that kind of God. But then there are those who believe in the true living God that says, don't kill, don't steal, uh, don't uh, be violent towards your neighbor. And so the question is, uh, is there a God? And then secondly, has he revealed himself to mankind? Now, among those who believe in God, there are those who believe that God exists, but he's not really involved. Uh, It's like he created everything and then just disappeared. Uh, The uh, deists, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, some of that uh, type were deists. And they, they, they say it's like this. It's like God wound up the world like he, one winds up a clock and he just set it apart and let it tick away. And everything's just happening the way he set it up. Uh, he's not particularly involved in a personal way. They have a very impersonal God. Well, again, there's very little difference between that and an atheist, because if God is not personal, if he's not watching, if he's not involved, you're kind of on your own there too. It's guesswork now. So has he revealed himself to mankind? That's an important question. Uh, Does God exist? And has he revealed himself? And thirdly, has he provided us with laws? Does this God who has revealed himself, has he said something? Has he told us things that are true? Has he told us how it should be? Has he given us rules to live by? Now, those who deny the existence of God have set themselves in his place. Only who gets to be God is the question. If one man thinks he is the ruler and he takes the throne of God, another man would disagree. Uh, Sometimes you had those who were so twisted in their mind that they actually demanded worship from the people that they ruled over, that they would treat them as if they were a god. Caesars would do this and others throughout history. Uh, They have a god complex, as they say. So when there are multiple claimants to the top spot, then war is the way that this is often settled. In order to agree, how do you agree? If one believes one thing and another believes another, If one person sees something this way and another person sees it another way, how are these brought together? How do you reconcile this? How do you solve the problem of people disagreeing? Well, number three, we will have to know and accept the truth. There has to be something bigger than your opinion. There has to be something bigger than my opinion. There has to be something called truth. Now, when truth is not recognized as even a concept, it is a perpetuation of warfare because there will be different versions of truth. And there is not such a thing as different versions of truth, but that's what people have. We must accept the concept of truth. We must acknowledge the concept of right and wrong. And we must surrender our own feelings and personal ideas to a higher and authoritative ideal. Uh, You see already how hard it is? How hard is it going to be? Who is going to say you're right and you're wrong? This is good and this is bad. Uh, It's not just might makes right. There has to be a place where right makes might. And we make it happen with God. And so these areas of difference uh, can be uh, understood that we must have the truth and know it's the truth. But now here is number four that's important. We will have to trust the truth. And that is where it gets difficult. Even if you believe there's a God, even if you believe he has spoken, what does it mean? How do we live under it? Can we trust this? And here is the the sad thing about it. God gave us a wonderful book from Genesis to Revelation. It is his truth. It is authoritative. It is inerrant. It is how we should live. And yet even Christian ministers today are tearing pages out of it and tearing sections out of it and saying, this does not apply. This doesn't mean what you think it means. Uh, This was written by the man instead of God. This is not blessed. This is not inspired. And that you come up with a much smaller Bible and it gets smaller all the time as men tend to say no to God and yes to themselves. Listen, we say yes to God and no to ourselves. It is the Word of God that corrects society. It is not society that corrects Scripture. We have two things that we must put uh, as primary in our lives we can choose. We can either choose Scripture or we can choose society. How has society been working for you so far? 
How has trusting society worked out? It hasn't worked out at all. That's where we get all the wars. That's where we get all the confusion. Yes, God made man righteous. God made man upright. But he sought out many inventions. He sought out many ideas. He's made up many alternatives. And until we come to a source of truth and call it truth and trust it as truth, we're not going to be able to agree and we're not going to have unity if we can't agree. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says this about the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We have one truly authoritative revelation from God, that is His divine truth, and that is the Bible, the Word of God. This revealed body of truth must be accompanied by evidence of divine revelation. It must come from God. It must be backed up by supernatural signs. And here's the wonderful thing about the Bible. This is the only book in the world that has that. This is the only book that is supernaturally blessed. This book has prophecy and fulfillment. Prophecy and fulfillment. Prophecy and fulfillment. Dozens and dozens of prophecies that were fulfilled exactly like they were given. And they tried to critique the Bible. They tried to uh, criticize the Bible and say, no, those passages were written at the same time as the fulfillment. And they were written to make it look like they were old and uh, to look like it was a prophecy that was fulfilled. And then later they find very ancient manuscripts of those very scriptures and they have to back up. But you never hear them apologize. You never hear them say, oh, we were wrong. You never hear them say, oh, I'm sorry, the Word of God was true. That is a real prophecy. You never hear that. All you hear is the criticisms. But I'm here to tell you today that the Word of God, this Bible, is the only book in the history of this planet that has supernatural evidence of His divine authorship. It is given to us by God. This is why the world hates it so much. This is why fallen cultures and fallen civilizations want to remove it from society. This is why there are places now where if you just stand up in a public square and read the Bible to people, they may even put you in jail. They hate the Word of God because they hate the God of the Word. The Word of God can be trusted, however, to be authoritative. 2 Peter 1, verse 20 and 21. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What the Bible is saying here is that this book is God-breathed. It is from God. And when men wrote it, they weren't writing their opinions. They weren't writing their ideas. They were writing the truths of God from Him. So, we will have to trust the truth. And then five, we will have to submit to the source of truth. Now, here is where this thing is really going. Okay? Until and unless fallen human beings come to terms with the author of truth, they're not going to come to good terms with the truth itself. The author of truth is connected to the truth, and the truth is connected to the author. If we're going to truly serve God, we don't just serve God's Word. We serve God who gave us His Word. There's a difference between that. Uh, The difference is very clear if we understand this. If we obey God simply out of fear, we're going to obey God better than we did when we didn't fear Him at all. But if we obey God out of love, we're going to obey God a whole lot more than we would just obeying Him out of fear. Loving God is the key to being able to fully obey Him and trust Him. We trust Him because we love Him and we love Him uh, enough to obey Him. It all comes down to the heart. A rebellious heart will rebel against God's Word. Uh, A rebellious heart will rebel against God's Word even if they understand it to be God's Word. He will rebel against God's truth. He will often rebel, rebel against God Himself. Here's what has to happen if we're going to come to unity and agreement and and harmony. And people, listen, people must be changed on the inside. 
there's something that's going to have to happen on the inside. You know, in our text, what we have is some people who uh, have come to a, an epiphany. They have come to a point uh, of surrender. Notice what, what it says. Uh, verse 2 of Micah chapter 4. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. You know what they're saying? Let's go worship the one true God. Let's go. Let's go there. And to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways. We want to learn. We want to know. How have we been wrong? And now we want to be right. What have we done before that was in error? And now we need to correct it. That's what we want to know. And we will walk in his paths. There will come a time when nations will realize that his paths are the best. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And notice it says, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Think about all the industry today that is placed on death. Death machines, death airplanes, death tanks, uh, death guns, death bombs. Things that are designed, millions and billions and even trillions of dollars spent on how to efficiently and effectively kill people. Think of all the effort, all the energy, all the work, all the money that is put into war. Wouldn't it be great if we could just take all those resources and do something better with them? You know what I think this means? It's symbolic, turning a sword into a plowshare. They would take it and they put it on an anvil and they would beat it until instead of it being an instrument of death, it would have a curve in it. And they would use it and put it on a plow and they could use it to, for some peaceful purpose. Think of all the things we use that could have a peaceful purpose. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do with all these tanks when the kingdom comes and there's no more war. Maybe they'll hook a plow to them and these tanks will be out there pulling plows. Wouldn't that be fun? The muzzle would be gone. Uh, there'd not be nothing on there to harm, but they'd be good for other uses, perhaps uh, farming uh, utilities and things like that. I think of all these rockets and things that they have. Uh, maybe they would find some good use for that. Rather than carrying bombs, they could do other things with them. Uh, I think of all the institutions, uh, West Point, Annapolis, all the military bases. What could they do? Well, find something good. Find something wholesome. Teach that. Uh, teach uh, farming, teach medicine, uh, teach uh, industry and, and carpentry. Uh, you, you don't need to, to worry about that. You don't need to study war anymore. I love that old uh, Negro spiritual, we ain't going to study war no more. I believe that a, a time is, is coming, amen? We're not going to study war no more. We're not going to have it. Uh, there'll be no need for it. No need for any kind of tanks or, or bombs. Notice it says, uh, they'll sit under their vine and their fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. When I was a boy, some of you remember this as well. When I was a boy, they had this drill that they would put us through. They would have this alarm go off. And what we were supposed to do is all of us were supposed to get up under our desks and crouch. Because a nuclear bomb from Nikita Khrushchev might come, and that's what we need to do. Now, it occurred to me while I was underneath that desk, hiding under my desk, listening to this, I thought, you know, if that bomb hits here, this isn't going to do me one bit of good. I had enough sense, even as a boy, to know that this was an exercise in futility. And even if it lands somewhere close by, uh, I was told that the fallout of it would be disastrous. I'd rather get blown up in one ball of light than die slowly of radiation poisoning. And I often uh, saw films and videos about how to survive a nuclear attack. And, and one of the things they said to do was instead of opening a can of beans from the top to turn it upside down and open the bottom because the top of it would have the fallout on it and the bottom of it would be safer. And I'm thinking, listen, if there's fallout on the top of your beans, you, you don't need to worry about which can of, uh, to open. It's everywhere. Listen, fear, fear. We were afraid. And we saw videos of Khrushchev 
taking off his shoe and beating on the pony of him, saying, we will bury you, and this had missiles in Cuba. Listen, that was just one example of fear. There's been fear ever since. We're wondering about the bomb. We're wondering about who's going to get strong enough, who's going to be crazy enough to do the, the unthinkable. The Bible says, listen, there's going to come a time <laughs> when you can work your fields and you're all tired and you're all worn out from work and then you say it's time to rest and you can sit in your lawn chair under your fig tree and say, I'm in perfect peace. Nobody's after me. I don't have to be afraid. And tomorrow it's going to be just like this again. Complete safety, complete peace. Listen, the world hasn't seen much of that, has it? But it's coming. It's coming. People must be changed on the inside. There's something wrong with us. But there's coming a time when we're going to be made right. Why? Because Jesus Christ is coming and He's bringing the kingdom with Him. And listen, those that don't like it, those that don't want it, those that will not submit to it are going to be dealt with by Jesus Christ. Listen, here is how war with Jesus goes. You want to know how it goes? He wins, you lose. That's it. That's it. When you go to war with Jesus, He wins, you lose. And the Bible says He will defeat them with the sword which proceeds out of His mouth. That is a word. All Jesus will need to defeat the devil, the antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet, and all the hordes of demons, and all the armies of the antichrist that the world gathers, all he will have to do is speak the word, and they will immediately be dead, dealt, gone, dead. And the Bible says in the valley of Jezreel, which if you get off and look at it, it looks like a, a large wine press. If the Bible says that the blood of the enemies of Christ will run high as the horse's bridles. I want peace, don't you? But listen, here's what the Bible says. There's going to be one more big war before there's no more. One more big one. And Jesus wins. He wins. And then there's no more war. Someone has to be strong enough and wise enough and authoritative enough and true enough to make it happen. And that will be Jesus Christ. And you know what I'm glad about? I'm already in that kingdom. That's my side. There was a time in my life when I had to choose sides. The Holy Spirit of God spoke to my heart. Jesus was drawing me towards salvation. He was convicting me of my sin. And I had to choose sides. I could stay on the side that I was already born into, naturally. Or I could choose to follow Christ and become one of His uh, subjects, one of His servants, one of His citizens. And I'm glad I did because I'm on the winning team. And even if I'm persecuted or even if I'm put to death by some lunatic atheist one day, I know one thing. I am going to be sitting on a, a cloud nine with Jesus for all eternity and nobody can take that away from me. I'm going to be at peace. Jesus Christ came to save the lost. He, get, he came to give them a new nature. He came to give them pardon from sin and redemption uh, so that we can be saved. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Pilate, when he was interviewing Jesus Christ, he was talking to him, are you a king? And Jesus says, my, king is not, my kingdom is not of this world. And he said, are you a king then? He said, I am come to tell the truth. And Pilate said, what is truth? And he walked away. Now that statement and that action is, a, is an illustration of the entire attitude of fallen man. What is truth? And they walk away. They walk away from the truth. Listen, when you walk away from truth, the only place you land is in the world of lies. When you walk away from truth, the only place that you can have left to go is where men make up their own truth. And the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. God is the truth. John 8, 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It is through Jesus Christ that we have freedom. It is through Jesus Christ that we have pardon. One day, thankfully, 
there will be no more war. Until then, we must be realistic. We must maintain armies. We must have soldiers. We must have the ability to defend ourselves because there are evil people out there. And thank God for our soldiers. Thank God for our veterans. Uh, we understand today that uh, fighting in defense of your country is uh, honorable and good, and we ought to appreciate those who do so. But I tell you, it's a sad reality that they even have to go. It's a sad reality that they have to go and put their lives at risk because of such evil in the world. We are to be agents of peace. We are ambassadors. And here's our message. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. You're a rebel now. Surrender instead. You are outside of his salvation. Come into his salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus one time put it this way. He that does not gather with me scatters abroad. Now what Jesus said is basically this. Jesus drew a line in the sand. And he said, if you're with me, you're with me. If you're not, you're not. That's it. There is no neutral ground. There is no wait and see. There is no, I'll make that decision later. It is always now. Jesus and His Holy Spirit will draw a line, and you have to decide where you're going to go in relation to that line. There was a time and place in my teenage life when I came on the side of the line of salvation through Jesus Christ, and He gave me a new life, He gave me a new heart, He made me a better person, and I believe that if people would come to Jesus Christ, they would stop wanting what their neighbor has. They would stop wanting to go and cross a border, to go and determine other people's welfare. I believe that we would have a peaceful world if we had a truly Christian world. All the so-called wars that have been fought in the name of Christianity were fought in the name of a false type of Christianity. Christians may be warriors, but we don't have Christian wars. Christians may serve in the military, but we don't have Christian uh, military units. What we have is nations, and what we have is individual Christians. And there's a big difference between these two things. We are not to use w uh, swords uh, in our advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to use words. And if our words bring swords against us, we are to be willing, we are to be willing to be sheep for the slaughter for our Lord Jesus Christ. The difference is, if you come to take my stuff, I may fight you. But if you throw me in jail for being a Christian, I may have to submit to it as a testimony to Jesus. And if you put me to death, I may have to submit to it. But he'll give me words to say on my deathbed, on my death dying day, that he will uh, use me to testify for him. You read Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you've never read it, you should read it. It is inspiring because what we find is over and over and over again, those who were called upon to die for the faith of Jesus Christ, they made such a testimony with the way they died that others came to Christ and were impressed with the reality of the faith. Until then, folks, we're going to have some casualties. Until Jesus comes and sets it right, we're going to have some more wars. We may even have some bad ones. But I'm looking forward to the time when there's no more war. Dear Father, we thank you for your love to us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, dear Father, that you have promised us in your word that there's coming a time when there will not be war anymore. They won't even learn war. won't be the need for it. All the implements of war will be turned to peaceful uh, purposes. And uh, Lord, we will all have safety and no fear. We look forward to that time. Lord, until that time, we're trying our best to do what we can to bring others into the kingdom of Christ, to bring others into his citizenship. I pray, Lord, for a national revival. I pray for a real, absolute pouring of the Holy Spirit that will bring people to Christ and genuine salvation that would affect the country uh, and Western civilization even for the good. But Lord, if that tarries and if that does not happen, Lord, I pray that you will hold the remnant in your hand and help us to be salt and light in these difficult times. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.